Dive into God's Word. Dig a little deeper. Discover the Bible's message for you today. Hello, thank you for joining me today. Our lesson title is Creation, the Fall, and the Cross. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this morning, for your mercy in giving it to us today. We pray that as we study some incredibly deep and important topics today, that you would give us understanding. Lord, as always, we pray not just for information, but for transformation as we study your word. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. The Bible's opening chapters contain much foundational material for everything that follows in the Bible. We've been looking at some examples of this this week, and today we're going to focus on connections between the, the book of Genesis, especially these opening chapters, and the rest of what the Bible tells us about sin and salvation and the importance of what Jesus Christ has done for us, the necessity of his death. Uh, if you have your Bible, turn with me to Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, and we're going to look at a warning that God gives to Adam and Eve. Genesis 2, verse 16, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Pretty clear warning, isn't it? Pretty clear command. Uh, God is laying out as simply and as explicitly as He can what is expected of Adam and Eve and what the consequences and results will be if they choose to disobey God's command. Well, we know the story, Adam and Eve disobey God, they eat that forbidden fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and according to God's words here in Genesis 2 verse 17, the penalty for sin is death. Now let's look and be very specific about what God's warning is. Genesis 2 verse 17 again, God says, Thou shalt not eat of it, that's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. According to God's own words, the penalty of sin is death, but it's not just death, it's death that same day. The idea is it's, it's immediate death. Um, you know. There's no delay. The day that you sin, you will die. Well, did that happen? Well, we know that the Bible tells us that Adam and Eve lived for a long time uh, after that day that they first sinned. Uh, if you look at um, Genesis chapter 5, verse 3, we start reading this, And Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image, and he called his name Seth. This, of course, is not their first son. There were at least two sons born to Adam and Eve before this, Cain and Abel. And so here is his third son. Adam is 130 years old now uh, when Seth is born. We continue reading in verse 4. And the days of Adam after he had begotten Seth were 800 years, and he begat sons and daughters. And all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. So Adam lives nearly a thousand years. We don't know how long Eve lived, but certainly it was in the hundreds of years as well. And so this leaves us with a question that needs to be answered. Back in Genesis 2, verse 16 and 17, God warned Adam and Eve very clearly that if they ate from that tree, they would die that day, that the penalty of sin is death the same day that you become guilty of sin. And so, why didn't Adam die that day? And you know, there's many uh, suggestions, answers that have been given to that, and many of them uh, are good and helpful answers. Uh, some answers that we could come up with uh, really aren't that good or helpful, such as, well, God lied to Adam and Eve. Well, that, that doesn't fit with the rest of what the Bible tells us about God. Uh, God was only bluffing. He was trying to scare Adam and Eve into um, obeying him. That doesn't fit the Bible's picture of God either, um, uh, certainly. I mean, God would be lying here if, if that had been the case. Maybe God changed his mind. Maybe he felt sorry for Adam and Eve. Um, but the Bible says that God does not change, and so that also does not fit. Um, you know, others have suggested that um, 
the day that God was speaking about was actually a thousand years. As Peter says in 2 Peter 3 verse 8, with the Lord a thousand years is as a day and a day as a thousand years. Well, no human being, according to the biblical record, has ever lived more than a thousand years. Some have gotten close. The oldest person that ever lived, according to the Bible, was Methuselah, and he lived 969 years. Almost a thousand years, almost that biblical day, but not quite. Um, and then others have suggested that um, Adam and Eve, well, not just suggested, it is true, Adam and Eve uh, began to die that day. The, um, the process of dying began, both physically, you know, they uh, began the process of aging and decay and deterioration. Uh, of course, it took them a lot longer to reach the point of death than it takes us today. Uh, also, it has been suggested that they began dying spiritually that day, and certainly that was true. You know, the Bible tells us that sin separates us from God. That happened immediately for Adam and Eve. Uh, they were fearful of God's approach that evening, um, and they hid from Him in the Garden of Eden, hiding behind that fig tree. Um, we're going to look today at an answer that places Jesus Christ squarely in the solution and in the uh, answer to this question, why didn't Adam and Eve die that day? And we're going to see that Jesus paid the penalty for sin and that he died the same day he took on the guilt of Adam and Eve's sin. First of all, uh, let's go to Romans chapter 5 and verse number 8. We read this, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And then verse 9 says, Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Wrath is the penalty of sin. Uh, and according to God, again, the penalty for sin is death that same day that you become guilty uh, of sin. And uh, the quick answer is that Adam and Eve didn't die that day because as soon as they sinned, there was a Savior that stepped in front of them and the penalty of their sin and said, I will take the penalty of sin. I will uh, suffer the wrath uh, that is directed against sin. Let them live. Let them have another chance. That's the quick answer. Now let's look at the Bible study that backs up that statement in Romans chapter 5. Uh, if, again, if you have your Bible, I'm turning now to the book of Matthew chapter 26. And at the beginning of this chapter, Jesus is walking, I'm sorry, not the beginning, in verse 36, uh, Matthew chapter 26, verse 36, Jesus is walking into the Garden of Gethsemane. This is the night before he dies, um, and he has already eaten that last supper with his disciples. And one of those disciples, Judas, has already left Jesus um, as Jesus dismisses him. Now, there's an important uh, point that the Gospel of John brings out in John chapter 13. And let's see if I can uh, land my eye on the verse. Yes, John chapter 13, verse 30 says this, He, that is Judas, then having received the sop, or the bread that Jesus handed him, went immediately out, and it was night. So when Judas leaves in that upper room, it's already nighttime. Now, according to the Bible, a day begins when the sun sets. Today, we would call uh, it Thursday night or Thursday evening when Jesus had that last supper and when Judas goes out. But according to the Bible, the sixth day of the week had already started. Um, and that's important as we continue our study. Later that evening, later on the sixth day of the week, Jesus walks into the Garden of Gethsemane and in verse 38, we read this, Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto the point of death. Tarry ye here, and watch with me. Now, Jesus is uh, basically quoting from prophecy in Isaiah chapter 53, and we'll turn there briefly. Uh, Isaiah 53 is a beautiful prophecy um, regarding the Messiah and the suffering of the Messiah and the death of the Messiah. And the last two verses say this, Isaiah 53, verses 11 and 12. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. So the context 
of these verses is that the Messiah would uh, bear the sin or the iniquity of the human race. Verse 12 goes on, Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. Now that's the part that Jesus was quoting. Again, when he walks into the Garden of Gethsemane, he says, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. In other words, Jesus is quoting this passage in Isaiah 53, trying to communicate to his disciples that a great um, darkness is coming over him. And what is that darkness? Well, the last uh, couple of lines here in Isaiah 53 tell us exactly what was happening to Jesus at the time that his soul was being poured out unto death. So going back to Isaiah 53, the last half of verse 12 says this, And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. This is talking about the moment uh, at which the Messiah becomes the sin bearer. Uh, now, Jesus uh, Christ, of course, was always sinless. He was always uh, holy. He was always the Savior of the world. But he was not always the sin bearer in the same sense that he became the sin bearer there in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before he died. A great change came over him here, and he accepted uh, as the sin bearer, as the sacrificial Lamb of God who was to die for the sins of the world, he accepted the guilt of of human sin that night in the Garden of Gethsemane. And as that happens, Jesus tells his disciples, my soul is being poured out even unto death. He's quoting this verse in Isaiah, trying to uh, let his disciples know exactly what is happening to him at that moment. No wonder Jesus asked his disciples to pray for him, and he asked them three times. No wonder Jesus had to pray himself three times. Not my will be done, but your will be done. As this great darkness of the guilt of sin um, is laid upon him. Now this happens, again, we call it Thursday evening. We call that the, you know, late on the fifth day of the week. It's actually early on the, the sixth day of the week. And later that day, Jesus dies. When we look at, uh, well, it's several places in the Gospels. Uh, Mark... <clears throat> Mark's gospel, I'll turn the other way, uh, tells us exactly when Jesus died. In fact, it tells us when he was hung on the cross, how long he was there, and when he died. Mark chapter four, uh, 15, uh, verse 25 says, And it was the third hour, and they crucified him, 9 a.m. in the morning. Uh, verse 28 says that he was numbered. Uh, well, I'll read the whole thing. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, and he was numbered with the transgressors. Verse 33 says, When the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And verse 34 says, At the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why did Jesus feel that his father had forsaken him? Because the weight, the guilt of sins was separating him from the Father, Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2 say that you know, your iniquities have separated you from God so that He cannot hear, He cannot see you when you pray to Him. And this is exactly what Jesus was experiencing as He hung on the cross. And He dies that same day that He accepts the guilt of sin. So why didn't Adam and Eve die that day? Because as soon as they sinned, there was a Savior that said, I will take the penalty of sin. I will take the guilt of sin. And friends, no human being has yet truly paid the penalty for sin, which is the second death. Jesus paid that penalty. He died that, that second death, that eternal death, as a penalty of sin, which is what makes His resurrection such an incredible miracle. He truly has the power over death. He has the power over sin. And He wants to give you that power in your life today. There is no temptation. There is no sin that He cannot break in your life when you ask him for help. Thank you for joining me today and please join me again tomorrow.